encryption just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone and welcome to the Time Shifters podcast. I'm your host Christopher, and I am here as always with Tom. Tom, how are you? Welcome back. Good, thank you very much. We ended up having to delay recording just a couple of days or whatever, but I don't know why. I think it's just because of the end it's Independence Day holiday or whatever. It feels like it's been forever since we recorded. I know, and it really, really hasn't. I mean, we've only. Pl- by the way, I will start here at the top of the show. Thank you for all the well wishes to the loss of. From my family, uh, a, a furry friend is n- missing, and it's hitting me hard. But that's part of why we're delayed in our recording. But thank you all to that took the time to provide their well wishes. Absolutely, absolutely. Our, our heart goes out to you, sir. Thank you. It just feels like it's been a month, but it's only been two weeks, right? <laughs> since we've since, since we recorded, I, I I don't know why it is. Like I said, I think it's just that break in the holiday where I feel like there's just an extra weekend has been thrown in or something. <laughs> Especially the way your work allowed you to be that off. Like like I was describing, I got a five day weekend out of it. You got a day somewhere off in the middle of your work week. <laughs> Yes, yes. It, it, I had like an extra Sunday and an extra Monday this past week. Yeah, not quite the way you want to do those things. Yes. Oh, uh, Before we go any further, this is something, you know, I always throw out what we're going to be watching. And I did that last time when we watched The Spirit. Mm-hmm. And a, a comment got by me. I didn't see that someone had replied to the post. Uh, and I, I saw it after the fact. So I just wanted to go ahead and, and, and read this real quick. Uh On social media, Lena Luna is the the person there, commented that my initial reaction coming out of the theater was threefold. One, that movie was trying to do something, but it didn't seem to be able to communicate to the audience what that something actually was. Two, it would have possibly made more sense if I'd been high on whatever they were smoking during production. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) And three, it's quotable as hell. Toilets are always funny. What smells dental and Nazi, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> no, she she nailed it. Like like we discussed, it it had moments. Just the yes. hole doesn't work. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Lena, if by chance you uh, listened to that episode and didn't hear your comment, uh, I hope you're listening to this episode. And, and my apologies for the, for not missing it. I. I forget which social media site I your comment was on, but it's one where the the replies don't always come up as nicely as they as I would like them to. Uh, we are on like every social media that has tried to like uh, take over Twitter's spot right now. Oh, are, <laughs> so are I'm, we I'm, into the? Because uh, there was one at the time of this recording just started. We are on threads. We are on threads. Wow. <laughs> I am. I, I have got an account over on Spoutable, on Macedon, on Threads, uh, something called Counter Social. If there's a social media, I've tried to find it that that doesn't require someone to invite me. If you can just go on and sign up, there is there is a place where I can post a link to the episodes and ask the questions and hope that someone responds. Well, you're gonna have to work on Blue Sky next. I think, isn't that one you need an invite for? Yeah, well, what it is is you sign up to get invited. <laughs> oh, that's too much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but that's one's got a decent shot at being a, a Twitter killer. Really? Yes. Oh, interesting. It, it, it's created by, uh, like, a former creator of Twitter. Right now, I my money's kind of going to uh, Mastodon, Mastodon, I think, is... Yeah, that seems to be the most kind of Twitter-like as far as the format and everything. Um, Spoutable's trying really hard, but I, I don't know if it'll be able to... You know, all these guys are going to be fighting for the same space, and it'll it'll be interesting to see which ones, you know, shake out in the mix. 
I have always relied on your fortitude for trudging through the slog of social media. So, yes, yes, you are not a social media maven. I, I am not. I've tried and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will support our show in any way that I can, but there are limits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nope, understood. Yeah, I know. I just happened to see a, a a thread on Reddit, another social media, and someone was mentioning threads. Is anybody going to you know put their podcast on that? I'm like, it's yet another place to post a link. So yeah. <laughs> yep. And that probably all happened. I mean, it's only existed for like a day and a half. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. But there were like over 3 million <laughs> accounts created in that like day. <laughs> yeah, but I was reading though that that is a little bit uh, probably inflated because it's branching off of uh, Instagram. Sure. So it's already kind of just porting people over. Sure. So it's like super easy. It, it's not like people have to go out of their way to go sign up. Someone logs into Instagram and says, you want to be on threads? Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's probably how I'm going to end up on threads. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that you were on Instagram until I signed up for threads, and it's like, oh, dude, here's all your Instagram follower or you know followers or friends. Do you want to add them? I'm like, oh, oh yeah, Tom's on there. Yeah, it's just a far <laughs> more incognito name. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, outside of that, I've had a chance to uh, watch a few things. I. I've been wanting to go back and revisit this for ages, and then I was listening to a Forgotten TV, who's doing a big retrospective on the old V miniseries. Yes, from uh, 1983. Yep. And so I was able to get a copy from the library, and I sat down and had the whole family watch it because it was actually something that my wife back in the day did not get to see. No. She was not one of the millions of people. I mean. I thought everyone was watching this in 1983. She was not one of them. Oh, my God. Yeah, and that was back when you really only had three choices at night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so she hadn't had a chance to, or she had not watched it. My son obviously hadn't watched it, and I have not watched it probably since 1983. But it's lived in my head rent-free <laughs> all this time. It's like I didn't really need to rewatch it. I knew this sh show. No, it, 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 it was very good, but as you'll get to, right up until the end. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the original V miniseries in 1983 is still really good. I mean, it's, that's an excellent production. It really, it, it holds up, it holds up really well cinematically, and it unfortunately holds up really well as far as the topics that are expressed. <laughs> a little bit. It's that which makes it a little sad. Um, yeah, you would hope 20 years. Hope, what am I talking about? 40 years later. 40 years later. <laughs> sorry. As much as we'd like to think it's only 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. No, sorry. Dating myself a bit. The, the original uh, two part miniseries. Excellent, excellent television. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Uh, the follow up, The The Final Battle, which came out in 84, is frankly awful. <laughs> Maybe awful's too strong. It's 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 bad. It it is bad, and it, well, and it's bad mostly because of the ending. <laughs> yeah, I I cannot express how much I hate the ending of that miniseries. I just absolutely, absolutely hate that ending. the The creator of V, Kenneth Johnson. Uh, walked away from that miniseries due to creative differences. The studio, everyone was trying to take this one way, and he's like, screw you, I'm out. And he has some big deal on the on the table for was like $3 million or something that was going to go to him. And they're like, you, no one walks away from that. And he's like, watch me. He walked. Wow. And he, he, he has never gone back to watch w what he did, but he did manage to, he happened to turn on TV one day and caught some scenes and whatever and he thought the same thing about that ending <laughs> what the hell was that where'd that come from such a cop-out ending oh it's terrible i i use prete nama to describe any time i'm watching a television show or a movie where just the ending gets pulled out of someone's butt <laughs> not to mention um well one of the things that it, it still haunts me to this day V actually is the source of one of my longest terrors as far as, uh, like, dreams and such. 
Um, the birth of the children. Oh, yeah. Um, that, well, that was in the final battle. Yeah, right? when, when, when I saw that the first time, I went to bed hysterical. Um, it's amazing you ever had kids. Kind of. Um, <laughs> and, and the notion, but no, uh, it's one of those that's now laughable, but kudos to the sound guy for the sound of the the lizard baby mm-hmm. kind of coming out of the womb uh, and the noises it made. That was what was creepy as hell. The sound set me off so bad that I didn't really watch what came out of her. <laughs> um, so my mind reeled at how terrifying this was. So at some point later in life, I had gone back and watched it again. <laughs> yeah. and, and, it's a hand puppet. <laughs> and it's a hand puppet that looks like a bell pepper. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. A bell pepper the with head teeth. of the thing looks like a green bell pepper. <laughs> yep. <laughs> with teeth. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it kind of kind of takes away a little bit of the of the uh, horror. Uh, yeah, no, because at that moment I'm like, uh, you know, uh, the 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 uh, the the radio of the mind kind of that notion that uh, that I only listened to what happened. And that freaked me out more if I had just laid eyes on it. I'd probably gone out of there laughing even at that age. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just so bad. But the ending would have been so much better if the lizard baby had lived. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. If it if it was the one that said, pray te nama and save the day, I'd be like all for it. That'd be great. Well, <laughs> I, absolutely. <laughs> but no, it had to be the pretty blonde girl. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so the family and I watched both the original miniseries. Not without the family, I have gone on to watch the series, series? The, the TV series. Yeah. Yes. Which uh, followed in uh, 84 going into 85. That is awful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. I, I haven't seen that in forever. I saw a few episodes, I think even then. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Well, that's the funny thing. I know because of who I was in 1984. I was going to watch this because it was science fiction on television. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I remembered bits from it. Yeah. But honestly, after I got past like the second episode, that was the end of my memories of that series. So I don't know if they must have maybe started jumping times or jumping days or they were preempted or whatever. And I never really got a chance to watch the rest of the series. Your bedtime might have been at a certain time. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe that's it. They they, um, they moved it to the ten o'clock hour, and you had to get to bed. <laughs> yeah, that maybe I I don't know what the story is, but uh, yeah, I don't recognize anything outside of that first step, like one, two, yeah, first two episodes. I don't recognize anything from this, and it's it's bad. It is done so on the cheap. Oh yeah, and uh, Michael Ironside. Is at least in the first half of this thing. Yeah. Apparently, he gets fed up with it and quits. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gotten to that yet, but I'm pretty sure I'm getting close. Yeah. Um, he's way too good for this thing. He's the best thing about this series. Sure. Just like his, he was like the best thing about via the final battle. Yeah. It's so ridiculous and mundane. The characters are just so cliche and cookie cutter and all. Everything that kind of made that first mini series so poignant and everything is well, they, they started erasing it in the final battle, and by the time you get to the series, it's just completely gone. I mean, it's so cheap, they don't even do the little uh, the voice effect on the uh, visitors. Oh, really? Oh, that's terrible because I had forgotten that they didn't, they dropped that. Yeah, so literally, it, everyone's just walking around. Anybody could be a visitor or a human. You don't know. <laughs> the, yeah, no. It, it, it had this feel for me like somehow they took V and turned it into a soap opera. Well, there is a lot of that. Oh, my God. You, you freaking had a love triangle or whatever between uh, Elizabeth the Star Child, who is now a 20-something adult because she goes through another transformation. Of course. Because kids are too much of a pain in the ass to have on set. Right. <laughs> Uh, you have a love triangle between her, her mom, and their, this new guy that shows up that ends up 
he and Elizabeth end up together, but his mom, like, or her mom falls for him too. And there's this whole, why did you tell me uh, when it's all revealed? And it's like, what the hell? Could someone shoot something with a laser for crying out loud? Uh, and then I don't know why, but uh, to this day, I, I make the comparison between Diana and the TV series with Susan Lucci from the, uh, <laughs> the, so the hair. The hair is pretty similar. Uh, this, the, the hair, the look, uh, the, the the just the attitude in how they approach everything in every scene. It's just like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> On the flip side of that, however, I have been watching Strange New Worlds yes. uh, season two. Um, I'm I'm three se- uh, three episodes in. I believe at the time of recording, a fourth one has has aired. I have not had a chance to see that one yet. And I, I did manage to watch that one because I am completely addicted to the show. I was going to ask you what you thought of this season so far. Uh, I I am, if anything, I'm even more in love with it before, and I'm trying to be. The, I, and I'm going to get to an element that does still t- kind of bother me because uh, w- well, it, it's the it's the Noonien Sung in the room. <laughs> I mean, Khan is just all over everything all the time in Star Trek, and I need them to put it to bed and, yeah. and carry on. But that said, um, I just I, I, I I'm trying to get myself to think. Do I like it just because it's new or do I like it because it's good? And I am leaning more and more to, uh, for the most part, it is consistently pretty good. I enjoy the stories. I enjoy the characters. I enjoy that we're letting, like, you had to get through the first season and the main crux. And, of course, it was all going to be always about the captain. But we are now getting into more individualized storylines. We're getting time with other characters and I'm liking that a lot. All right. You must obviously have another feeling. (laughs) Yeah, I actually am not loving this season so far. Uh, I'm definitely, I would not go so far as saying I don't like it. Right. It's just, I'm not loving it. Um, the, The courtroom drama episode was I thought was good. It was well acted and well written. And Star Trek always tends to put on a good courtroom drama. They do. Uh, and, and then, of course, it's all very timely. That it, it did what Star Trek is good at doing. It it it, it hid a lot of uh, today's angst into what it was trying to communicate. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um. Oh crap! What was the uh, first episode about? Uh, the first episode was the uh, false flagship, uh, the Klingons trying to reignite the Klingon war. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. And, and it was Spock's first outing as a, as, as he stole the ship. <laughs> right, yeah, he stole the ship. Yeah, and see, that's, isn't that terrible? It's like, it's only three episodes in, and I'm already forgetting what the first episode was even about. You consume a lot of media. Well, maybe that's it. I only have so much room in my head. And, and, and you're getting old. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I, I would accept that as an excuse, except, like I said, I remember a miniseries from 40 years well, ago. Say, well, <laughs> if you're going to shoot holes in my argument. <laughs> the, the time travel episode really wasn't a fan of. I, I really, no. it's like, God, you're only two episodes into this, or three episodes into this season and already we're doing time travel. And it really feels like, and this is the episode where they're like really trying to get us to like their Kirk. Well, yeah, I get, I, I got that. <laughs> you, you couldn't have waited a little longer before you start doing time travel again. It, it seems like a trope that's a little too tired in Star Trek. It, it needs, needs to back off a bit with that. And that, of course, does bring up the con thing that you were mentioning. And it started off so great, too, with the, the, the idea that she works actively to not develop relationships. And this got into more of why. And it, I had an opportunity to break some of that down a bit. Um, and then I was a little fascinated, and I'm not going to spoil anything, but the, the way they handled at the end... Uh, 
brings up thoughts of things beyond any of the timelines that we've seen to date, too, other than they've it, it's been intermingled in Enterprise before, too. Uh, the notion that Starfleet has to take on a temporal role at some point. Um, and I actually kind of like that. And I like that that actually ties directly back to Enterprise. Mm-hmm. So they're finding ways, even with this show that sits obviously in a space that none of the others do, but it's finding ways to tie them all in. And I'm still enjoying the episodic nature of it. I like the, the that these the, there's always going to be a building progression, but I really do like that you do get your story of the week. I just enjoy that. I would I would agree with you about Laon and you know some character development if it were done over a time longer than just an episode. I felt like this was it, it felt forced to me. Okay. When you got a character that be one thing and then by the end of the episode, you know, she's crying about being another kind of thing. It was like that all took place in 50 minutes. <laughs> uh I, I get what you're saying, but again, it's some of the nature of it being an episodic. <laughs> yeah, thing. no, I get it. It's just that kind of character development, I feel, actually would benefit from... You could still be an episodic and still have a thread that goes through multiple episodes that could have culminated in something like that. Having it all happen in one episode, I felt a little forced. But see, I, I'm going to give you a little room to breathe, maybe. Um, that character ve- development, seeing emotion come out of a character that's tried hard not to to be emotional. Um, she only did it in private. Yeah, true. Uh, so she hasn't necessarily changed how her persona is in front of others. Um, and we'll have to see what comes of that. So... If she in, if they instantly turn her around and she's just soft and fun with everybody because she's her heart grew three sizes that day <laughs> she had the Grinch moment. Um, if it comes to that, then yes, you're absolutely right. That was crap. <laughs> but, but right now, it's just more of an introspective kind of thing. And as long as they leave it there, but we got to see it, we got to participate in. We were the third party, not the, the the outside looking in. And if they leave it at that and she just she has to have the her walls come down more for that to really mm-hmm. go, then they're on to something. If they just crash them down now, you're right. Then it was it was too quick and it, it won't work. But we'll have to see in future episodes. Carol Kane's character in the show. Yeah. Not not really loving no, her either. Not right? loving. I, I feel like she's uh I I, <laughs> I feel like she's the same woman that uh, you know the uh same woman that she was in uh Princess Bride. <laughs> kind of. Um she, well hell it could be her taxi character. <laughs> yes. Um, I almost I I kind of wish when they decided to give you know oh she's a I forget the name of her species or whatever. It I'm sorry they couldn't have done something like a Latka, Latka something or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ha- well, you know what? I'm going to give a little nod to this particular episode for one other thing. We didn't go to an American city. I love that. I actually absolutely a thousand percent love that. That, you know what? History doesn't all take place in our country. <laughs> right. <laughs> so... The things that could set the, the the path of our of of the timeline, the notion that they don't all happen within the great old U.S. of A. Absolutely, I, I could like the episode just for that alone. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see what they do with the the, the character uh, Carol Kane's character, but um, yeah, she's just uh, it feels a little too. I don't know. I don't want to say parody ish. But it's maybe a little too comical. Yeah, it's a, it, she's the comic relief character, and, and the thing of it is, is it's not that comedic. It's not that funny. Um, but I feel like she's trying to be right. And, and, and uh, I'm sorry, and if it's her voice, I, I apologize. But her voice is a little grating, especially how she's playing this character. I've I've 
uh, seen Carol Kane do interviews, and yes, she does have a very peculiar and, and unique voice, but I still think she's kind of stepping it up a notch. Yeah, and, and it, it's it's borderline too campy. I mean, this is just they're trying to take this like seriously. They're and mm-hmm. they're doing a pretty good job overall. Now, uh, what I'm encouraged by by even you saying that is any good trek. We all know this. You got to get your legs under you before it gets really good. Sure. Um, so we're still in growth. But the point is, is it, it it didn't come off of a good first season and fall off the cliff. They're not no, terrible. No. You might not be latching on to all of it, but you're not hating it either. <laughs> no, no. It's it's certainly something I'm like, OK, I'm I'm willing to give you this, but you better improve. Is kind of how I feel, you know. I, I'm, I'm hoping. I shouldn't say it, it, it's not up to them to please me. I guess. <laughs> oh, and and I've been having conversations with friends that watch the series too, and I, I'm just gonna go ahead and love on it for this. It is scrubbing the uh, existence of Discovery out of existence. Mm. Um, for instance, our Klingons are are our Klingons. They're, they're the or ones much, that have existed. Much closer. Since, yeah. They're, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, the prosthetics are a little cleaner. They look a little better. That comes with having some some budget and progression and in, in being able to apply that stuff. But the, the point is, they are the Klingons that we have known since the motion picture. Since they developed them for the motion picture and kept them in next generation, that's who they were. The Discovery Klingons gone away (laughs) um the other thing is every time we see another ship another starfleet ship they look like the retconned version of original series ships they did do one little loving little touch to give discovery a little bit of love in that first episode since you're you're letting it fade into memory the uh (laughs) The ship that was used by the Klingons on the planet to try to Mm -hmm. revive the war, when it comes off planet and it takes a bank, um, the saucer section is segmented like the Discoveries was, where there's Mm. gaps in the the saucer section. I didn't notice. Okay, interesting. Yep. But other than that, the ship looked like uh, a variation on the Constitution class. Yeah, had the round the cells hanging out the bottom kind of thing. Yes, and, the, yeah. the larger engines. They're not tapered. They're not super skinny. They're they looked chunky. They looked like a, a, a retcon of original series other variations. So, yeah. but they still threw in a little touch of the something that came out of Discovery just to kind of give you that. Okay, this was supposed to be an older ship. Mm-hmm. But it didn't look like all the ships that we saw in Discovery, where they were all looking like they were more advanced than any of the stuff that we had seen to date. No, I'm still with it. I will still continue to watch, and we'll see how the rest of the season pans out. Given your relationship with more current Trek, this is a this is a shining moment for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I think we should probably get to our main topic uh Let's take a uh, break real quick, and we'll listen to a promo for another podcast. And when we get back, we jump back in time. (laughs) (laughs) We go to 2008's 10,000 B.C. In 1972, American TV networks canceled 12 TV shows for crimes they didn't commit. These shows were promptly forgotten by the public and faded into obscurity. Today, Chris Cooling researches these shows for a podcast. If there's a TV show that no one else remembers, and if you have earbuds, maybe you can listen to Forgotten TV.
10,000 BC is a film directed by Roland Emmerich and was released in 2008. It is an adventure film set in the late Paleoithic, Paleoithic era. The movie follows the journey of a young hunter named Dela, Delay. I think it was Delay, wasn't it? Uh, sure. I never really caught any of the names while I was watching yeah. it, so let's go with that. Yeah, uh, he was either, no matter how you say his name, he's portrayed by Stephen Strait. And he, the character, sets out to rescue his kidnapped love, Evelet, played by Camilla Bell. Delay, along with a group of warriors from his tribe, embarks on a journey to save Evelet from a powerful slave-owning civilization. Do you know I watched this entire film and didn't connect Stephen Strait to The Expanse? I just clicked on it and discovered that a bit myself. <laughs> I, I, I kept looking at him. I'm like, I know this guy, but I couldn't peg where he was from. I didn't recognize him whatsoever. I thought that was funny when I was doing a little research. Stephen Strait, why wow, that name sounds a little familiar. I just kind of did that you know, on the Wikipedia kind of thing, hover over the link. and yep. Wait, wait, <laughs> that's who? <laughs> not, not only is he in The Expanse, he's the main protagonist. <laughs> yeah, like, and, oh, he's in The Expanse. What character is he in The Expanse? Oh, he's the star. <laughs> he's the star of the show. He's Jim Holden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, first time watch for me, I... Never got around to seeing this one. I think you said this was the first time. Yeah, watch this is the first right? time watch for me too. Uh, we are kind of the outliers, apparently. This did really well at the box office. I think it. Uh, I think it more than doubled its. It, it doubled or tripled its budget. Wow, it's actually one of Roland Emmerich's most profitable films. Okay, <laughs> I'm not sure why. <laughs> I don't know why. I really. Uh, yeah, I mean this. And I've, I've said it before of some other films. I, I feel like this film commits the cardinal sin of any action film in that it's kind of boring. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Oh, my God. Yes. Uh, we, uh, My son watched this with me, and we were bored out of our mind. And here here's the thing I'm going to put out there. Tell me if you, 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 you feel the same. This is a movie called 10,000 B.C. Yes. First off, our two main people are some of the prettiest people you will ever see. So <laughs> kind of not what the vibe you're going for. Um, and then secondly, th I will say it outright. Th this isn't violent enough. No. Everything is super clean. Uh, everybody cares about each other. This is supposed to be a period of time where we are just barely beyond being animals. <laughs> and, and the notion that you can co come across everybody and have bloodless fights, uh, uh, assuming you have a fight at all. Um, our villains in this, we're the kindest villains I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really nice when the warlord you know, pulls the whole, yeah, I'm evil, I'm terrible, and I will have you. But I will, I want you to come to me, and I'm not going to actually take you. Like, that's nice of him. Well, not to mention that this is supposed <laughs> to be the same band of rogues that uh, wiped out um, Evelette's village, prior village, and she has wandered into theirs to to become their, their hope for the future. Um all based on mystical stuff. But uh, um, all that aside, they supposedly laid total waste to her village, but when they pulled into this one, they killed one person, they burned one tent, and they stole a bunch of people that they then proceeded to take very good care of. <laughs> I'm not seeing the evil here. For one thing, I, I think it's kind of... Um kind of crazy that these people apparently travel hundreds if not thousands of miles to collect their slaves mm -hmm. if following the you know the path of our characters in the film who then go to rescue the slaves bump up against three four five different other tribes sure that seem to be a lot closer <laughs> to uh to to the home of these uh slavers Closer, more populated, um, overall kind of stronger and healthier. <laughs> Easier to get to. <laughs> yeah, no, they're on the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and let's talk a little bit like that. This, this is something I, I 
don't understand. In one scene, we have them trudging through the snowy mountain pass where our where our tribe, our hero's tribe, you know, Delay's tribe lives. Mm-hmm. They're in like a mountains, you know, they're going through a, a mountain pass, snow on the ground and everything. And then they are hacking through a jungle. Sure. And then just a few scenes later, they're in a like African desert. Mm-hmm. Where the hell are they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's one theory that this actually takes place in South America. Okay. Based on the uh, the tiger, the saber tooth tiger, and the uh, the terror birds. With the, the the last terror birds, they think were found like in around where what would be Florida. Okay. So maybe South America is not too stre- much of a stretch. Mm-hmm. And the icy mountains are actually the Andes. And the jungle is on the rainy side, and the desert's on the dry side. But the only thing that kind of breaks that down is, you know, there's a pyramid. The Egyptian pyramid. <laughs> yeah. And there's another theory that says that there's actually nothing here that explicitly says that this is Earth. <laughs> I, I, I'll take that over anything because here, here, here's the thing. And I ex- actually explained this to my son um, immediately following watching this. Of course, we all remember Stargate, right? <laughs> yeah. This, Another Roland Emmerich film. Right. This feels like everything that took place on the planet just before um, the aliens came back and landed on the pyramid. Right. This is like everything that happens right up to the time that um, James Spader and crew show up. <laughs> so this is right. everything before that. That's what 10,000 BC is. It's a prequel. This is taking place in Abydos, is what you're saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> and the slavers are actually building the landing pad for the uh, the gold spaceship. Sure, which also follows with the fact that they kind of kept hinting at maybe there was an alien presence related in this. There, there, there was a shadow of that. Yep, it was uh, alien or Atlantean or both. Right, to, to any of these people, all of the above, so... Um, yeah, what, whatever it was, I, I am saying flat out this is a prequel to Stargate. And I'll go with the that somebody said this takes place on another planet because it does. It that's, yep. that's what was happening on that planet before we saw the movie Stargate. I I like it if uh, there's I will like words. it better if that was the I case. Don't, <laughs> I don't know if Emmerich has said it himself or if other people have just kind of tied it together, but they say like the Roland Emmerich films all take place in the same universe. That's the only way that this one really works. I think I I like that idea. And, and even though I uh, I I've said that out loud, that's exactly what I formulated while I was watching this film. I still don't like the film. <laughs> No. <laughs> no, there, there's so much that's just there's a lot wrong with this film. Uh the the motivation for everybody is just is just it, it's all look, we we need it to be this way, so just roll with it. Mm-hmm. The b- very beginning, I, I don't know what to think of it. You know, the oh no, I really love her, and I can only have her if I if I win the the spear and become the lead hunter. And okay, I've got it, but oh, I I I kind of cheated a little bit because the 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 mammoth actually sort of just fell on my spear, so I'm gonna give it up, and and would that also gives her up, and you're like, I uh, I guess that's honest, but aren't you? You're in a freaking tribe of <laughs> post Neanderthal, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm like who cares yeah, how the, it happened? You took down like the lead bull mastodon or whatever the hell it is. Go, just just roll with it. Yeah, the, the, these are people that literally live from 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 hunt to hunt. I mean, yeah. their their existence, and, 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 and this is where you can get back to. How how did those people even know to go to that mountain to get people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you went through the entire treasury that is required to get to that snowy mountain where this very little village is, barely a village. I mean, these people, there's like maybe what, 20, 30 of them? 
<laughs> but we see, right. Right. They, they, they weren't exactly a mass group. So, um, and they hadn't even figured out to be nomadic yet. They're just kind of hanging out there waiting for the mammoths to come back around. How does anybody know that they're there? <laughs> right. So. Yeah. No, there's so much. It doesn't really make sense. It, but, even you, it, This isn't even like, oh, well, if you pull at the thread and like, no, no, this is literally you hold the thing up and you can see through it. <laughs> you don't have to pull threads. Your, your, your crochet art is not complete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, uh, yeah, no. So the notion of uh, the, 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 the morality play within, <laughs> within, within a, a, a tribe of people that are barely hanging on. <laughs> and, and no one was like questioning. It wasn't like there was someone that knew the truth. No, 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 was, no, no, no. Uh, tick, tick. Um, uh, the the guy that was taking care of our hero delay um, after his father had left, he right. did witness that the that the mammoth fell on the spear. Okay, but he was a friend, right. Of delay, right? Yeah, delay, delay, whatever. It wasn't like the. Uh, the other guy that was trying to, you know, the other suitor. Oh, the yeah, guy the that rival. was trying the ri- the rival. Thank you. I could I was I was reaching for the word and I couldn't <laughs> grab it. Uh it wasn't like the rival knew the truth and was trying to like uh, stir seeds of doubt or anything like that or or was threatening him or he he was annoyed and maybe upset about it, but he wasn't do- trying to do anything about it. So where's the drama here really? This is just some guy's guilty conscience. Well, and then I'm going to tangent off of that. So we do, you, we've mentioned the rival. There was a rival for for the heart of this woman, who I, I think he was more in it for the spear than the chick. But that, that, yeah, um, that that's fine. Um, but so we're we're mentioning that he's a rival and that he's uh, he's really kind of digging on a delay and all that. He ends up one of the ones captured. And then he is one of the ones that makes this this grand uh, attempt to stave off. There, there's a plan to win at the end, but there's a hitch because the mammoths aren't behaving. And we get this grand moment where he's going to be the, the big guy. He's going he's gonna to hold off the horde until the plan can go off as planned. And so we're getting this moment where the, the rival, the... Uh, the, the kind of the burr in the saddle here is going to have a moment and rise above. But we didn't get any character development out of any of that, so we don't know why we care. <laughs> yeah. I think that was Ka Ren. Yes. Or as I kept reading it, I kept looking at him like, Karen? Really? <laughs> uh, yeah. So- I almost wanted him to be a Karen. I That would have worked better for me if he was like, uh, excuse me, Delay, I'd like to see your manager. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, looking at this cast and, and, and all that during that, I, I was pretty sure there was a Starbucks around the corner from that uh, that pyramid. So, I mean, these were the most well cared for slaves. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's deleted scene. What you find out is that pyramid is a Starbucks. <laughs> oh, well, that, that explains why they would travel across the universe to land on it. Yeah. <laughs> They just need a refill. All the characters in this are just, they're just shades of what they should be. Yeah. It, I, I feel there's just, there's nobody with any real depth or, or interest through this entire film. And when you're talking about, about making a movie about um, early man, um, I don't even know if I need character development if you just give me the base story (laughs) this should be pure action this should be every moment is going to could possibly be the end of the life of this character because that's the world that you that you're trying to tell you're trying to trying to convince us that you're telling this story in is like this is this is a world where every day could be your last day Exactly, which is why I said it's also way too damn clean. I, I mean, yeah. I need this to get dirty, filthy, and, and I don't mean we have to have prolonged rape scenes or something with the slaves, but I'm, I'm talking about there's got to be a little gore. There's got, like, 
if you're gonna have a fight, there needs to be some blood. <laughs> there needs to, there needs to be damage. I need to see that this is hard. I'm sure this was a uh, PG-13. It was. Yeah, yeah. This this should have been an R for violence. And, and they should have ratcheted it up all the way. I mean, th- th- that's what you would expect from this. Or at least, I mean, honestly, I'm trying to th- figure out why this was PG-13. Right. This honestly, I feel like could have easily been a PG film. If you're going to do a PG-13, you could have done a lot more of this film and kept a PG-13 rating, but you still could have done a lot more in this film to at least paint this world to be the the dangerous world in which it should be. Right, yeah. That, and that that's, you, you hit it on the head. I, I've been skirting around it. I didn't get a sense of danger out of this environment no, at all. No. <laughs> no, this is this is 10,000 BC by Disney. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you might as well have had these guys doing sing singing songs and doing dances. I, I might have actually enjoyed that more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, felt like there was more threat in uh, the animated Prince of Egypt sure. than I found in 10,000 BC. If you to keep sort of within the theme. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Egyptian lore or whatever. But even then, that that's supposed to be a little closer to now than, than 10,000 yeah. BC. Um, actually, there was a little too much civil, civilization in this film for you to convince me that this was supposed to be 10,000 BC. But then again, if we go with our thought that this is literally a prequel to Stargate and it's happening on the other planet, then I don't know, maybe... <laughs> Now I don't uh, I don't know if uh, that makes our uh, leader of the slavers a, a gould <laughs> from Stargate, or but at least the human guy left behind, or something. <laughs> maybe, but how was that for a letdown? You know, this thing he's shrouded in, in, in linens. You never see his face. You see the weird skeletal hands, and he's got the craggly voice, and he's worried about the the prophecy that's going to blah blah blah. And he's literally taken out with a, with spear. a single wimpy spear throw. Mm-hmm. It's not even like an impressive spear throw. Honestly, they didn't even do a good job of like animating the spear or anything. It literally it was a guy throwing a like stick. a fake spear <laughs> yeah. and it like it does a little wobble or something yeah. as it flies through the air. Spears the guy and he's dead. That's it? That's the end of our big bad? That's the end of our big bad, but even after we get past that scene and they go into the temple and inside the temple there is a a full ship inside there, just just a ship that might actually a ship that you wouldn't have seen for at least another um, ten thousand years, <laughs> but uh, a, a ship and that was supposed to be climactic too, but I don't know why. There's actual several moments in this film where I feel like there was something that was supposed to be <gasps> oh a big reveal, right? But you're like. I I don't I don't get it. Yeah, I, I, I'm missing what you're going for here. Uh, yeah. s- similarly, I mean, all of this is all taking place at the end of the film too. Like, our old mother is apparently somehow mystically tied to the Evelet character, and we get to a point Evelet dies. Mm-hmm. Um, but the old mother is dying at the same time and apparently gives her breath. From all the way across from wherever <laughs> to give her back life, and get, where the hell did that come from? Pretty sure her her last gasp of the air was pretend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, it's a good little segue from what you have been watching because that's exactly what that is. The, that it, this was a pretend moment that she she was brought back because the script said so. <laughs> right. It's, it's so awful. It's really not not good. This even, honestly, when I'm sitting here watching the film, I'm just I'm watching it, and I get done watching it, and I go, "Well, I I I don't know. I guess I watched a movie." <laughs> but now, the more I think about it, and then sitting here and talking about it, it's like, God, this this was actually really bad, wasn't it? It was. It's, <laughs> it's not a good movie. I, which is why I'm stunned. I didn't look up any of the stats, and for you to tell me that it doubled, it's. It, it, what it may, what it took to make the thing, 
it is astounding to me because I don't know who goes, sits in a theater and goes, damn, that was good. Yeah, uh, supposedly budget was around $105 million, and the box office was somewhere around 270 Okay, yeah. Um, so I'm guessing a lot of people went and saw this before word of mouth got around. <laughs> <laughs> and we might have to start doing a follow-up segment on the show because I want people to listen to us. And if you were one of the ones that went out there and watched this and were happy that you had plunked down your $15 or whatever you did to, to see the movie, are you happy with that decision? I mean, yes, your money went toward the, the funding of this thing, but, I mean, did you really enjoy this? I Really? Uh, there, there was some terrible green screen during all of this, too. Like, that... Maybe it was just because of the size of the screen that I'm watching on in 4K and all that fun stuff. Oh, that that may... Yeah, that may distract. It, yeah. it may distract a bit, but um, there were some distinct moments where their village was clearly not in the space as the backdrop of all this. Oh, interesting. No, I certainly did notice that on, the, on what I was watching. Uh, I, I don't have the 4K, you know, I've got a, you know, 1080p or whatever, right. but I don't have the big, you know, 4K television or anything like that. Um, so I don't get that. I thought overall, I thought the effects and the visuals, I, I did think were impressive. Obviously, a lot more money went into that than went into script. No, and, and admittedly, their creatures looked pretty damn good. Um yeah. Uh, and, and I give them kudos for being in some of the scenery that they were, but there, there were some moments that, uh, it, because of the way that I got to watch it, it was a little off-putting. Not to mention, I was still struggling with this village and the mountains and the snow and the cold and all that, and they don't seem to be wearing a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a very good point, too. And they did do a lot of location uh, shooting and everything. Sure. Will and Emmerich actually went, I mean, they went to the Africa... Um, they ended up having to go to New Zealand to film some stuff because apparently for some reason he wasn't allowed to use a helicopter in Africa. Okay. So they had to go to New Zealand to do some shots. So there was a lot of where they could have done green screen. They didn't. They did location. No, that's, that's good. That's cool and awesome. Um, the uh, the terror bird attack I thought looked really good. Yeah. Um, even the what could have been really bad I thought still did a pretty decent job was the saber tooth tiger especially saber tooth tiger drowning in water no uh, and, and i was hoping we would talk about that a little bit now it looked just fine and of course now we're getting we're, we're, we're throwing in the uh the thorn in the lion's paw story oh uh, yes um but then it pushed it too far when the, the saber-toothed tiger shows up to save him yeah. from the tribe. That The tribe didn't even look that menacing. It didn't look like they were going to do anything. So the saber-toothed tiger shows up, and I don't know that it needed to be there. No. And why was it even following him in the first place? It, it, it literally, it's, it, he saves it. It wanders off. Fine. You know, it's gone. This is in the jungle or whatever. He goes to some freaking desert village, beats up this tribe. He looks like he's in trouble. And apparently Speartooth, the tiger here, following him all the way just to show up, growl a little bit, and then walks away. Sure. That's the end of it. Like, what the hell was that? Exactly. And that's what's... That's... Again, the elements of this movie that just like what the what are you trying to make here? All because then the the tribe says, "Oh, we've been waiting. The prophecy has said that one who ta can speak with Speartooth will save us." Sure, sure. Why not? You know why we're talking about Speartooth? That's something that just that annoyed me in this film. Yeah, is that we are a you know ten thousand BC tribe. We're we're just a step above Neanderthals. Like the the old uh, the old woman in the village is like supposed to be like actually Neanderthal, and she's like the last of her kind or whatever. Mm -hmm. So these are like early Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. They they have spears. They have tribes. They have people. They have uh, you know they have uh, 
hunts and they they have you know they have language they have language they have mythology they have mythology all that stuff and everything and then out of nowhere they always come up with ah spear tooth and four-legged demons why don't why why aren't they riders why aren't they why don't you call them horses? Why don't you know that they're horses or, or have a yeah. name? They, they give some goofy name for the, the mammoths, um, the nooks or something like that. That's fine. It just seems like it was very strange how they, um, this whole society, this entire world, just kind of pick and chose when they decided to do something ancient. Mm-hmm. Oh, they, they, they fly across the water. They're in boats. Why don't you just call them boats? Well, and even before we get to the boats, uh, as they're chasing after the the band, the horde that just took all their people, um, they keep uh, they're convinced that they're just flying away off of there. Um, and, and I'm like, why? I mean, you saw them. <laughs> you literally saw them on on, on horses, and that, that that's a thing to it. 10,000 BC people were riding horses? Mm-hmm. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, yeah, that's something that um, some of the really picky people had pointed out as far as just things don't happen. 10,000 BC horses weren't horses. Right. <laughs> they were like two thirds the size. They were smaller, they were stockier. You know, um, terror birds didn't exist. But again, we're on another planet. So. Oh, yeah, good point. <laughs> We got to go with the whole alien world. Yeah, because again, it's the only way to make any of this fit is just to say we aren't where you think we are. That almost saves it. Almost, but almost. The story doesn't change. Unfortunately, the crappy story doesn't change, regardless of where you place this. Yeah, no, the movie still sucks, and it, and it sucks for all the wrong reasons. It's, there, there's some good stuff here, but it's just dull. Yeah, it's very dull. It, I think it looks great. It does, I think, well, it looked pretty. It did, but yeah, no, it fits the category. That is the best, I think, I can say about this film. We've watched a lot of movies where we can say, well, it looked pretty, and also, you know, this actor was kind of fun, or this idea was cool. This one's got nothing besides the appearance of the film. No, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, at no point did I not go, okay, yeah, that looks that, that looks nice. I just, I literally don't care about anything that you're doing. <laughs> you are not, you are not holding my attention in almost any way, and anywhere no, where no. you should be, like even the, even the mammoth scene, <laughs> somehow managed to be absolutely dull. Nobody got trampled. Um, there doesn't. There was never a sense of real danger. Would this have been more enjoyable in the theater experience? Would I mean the really big screen and like and then the surround sound and to be able to to feel it? I'm I'm sure if you're sitting in a theater and the 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 trumbling of the mammoth and you know and everything, you'd be able to feel that in the seat. I would hope. I would think. Would that have made the experience a little bit more enjoyable and 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 pulled you in more you haven't sat in my living room so i I can get pretty damn close to that (laughs) without having the full theater wall but uh um but i'm I'm still gonna go with no because i like even in the scene with the mammoth where the try okay we're not even into the real drama of the film yet he's just still trying to win the love of his life by being the first to kill the mammoth um and you're watching them creep, creep along all the mammoths that have returned to graze in this particular area. And I'm on board at that moment. Except they have decided to scare the herd instead of... Like, they're they're literally right under one. All you have to do is take the spear and just go, Bop, and you're done. Yeah, no, I... Did not understand the the thought behind their hunting process. They are all over this herd, and then they have to go chase them because they scare them. Because now they they want to scare them and, and and herd them into this past where they can single out one. I'm like, why? Why do you need to do that? And like why you said, you, you, why are you singling out one? You guys are starving. 
You have waited all of this time for the herd to show back up because apparently that's part of the deal is you need the herd to come back. And you've been noticing a migration change. They kind of discussed that at the beginning that the the herd's not showing up as often as it, it usually does. But now the herd has shown up. You have an opportunity to capture as many as you can get your hands on. They're all right there. You're all laying directly under the things. Put a spear up through their heart and call it a day. Um, but you didn't do that. You scared them off. You made them run. You only wanted one out of the crowd, and you botched that too. <laughs> and But in none of it, in, in any of the things that are happening... There was no sense of danger. There, uh, nobody lost their lives in, in, in all this. I mean, this should have been super dramatic, and it just wasn't. You're watching all these mammoths running. You're seeing these people, and of course, you know our hero sort of like just misses and get and dodges a couple big, sure. you know, whatever. I I felt more threat. You go back ten years earlier than this. I felt like there was more of danger, like watching Jurassic Park when all the, the the raptors go running across and they have to dive behind the you know the the log. Absolutely, that was more that was exciting. That was more exciting. That's that's still more exciting than this film, and it's ten years later. Right? Yeah. No. Uh, any things that he should have learned that should have gone into this weren't there. No, 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 it's, it's, it's a shame. I think maybe Roland Emmerich has just felt like he was maybe, uh, I think it was a mistake for him because he was, he felt a little, uh, maybe he had one hand tied behind his back because he couldn't figure out a way to actually make anything explode. <laughs> True. Yeah. They couldn't think. I'm, I'm amazed no one invented gunpowder in 10,000 BC <laughs> in this film. Now, now, now they, they, there should have at least been casks of oil. Of some kind, something that could have yeah. uh, from from a, a spark somewhere could have gone off, could have blown up the ship that was in the temple at the end. It, they it does burn. burn. Down. He gets he yeah, he gets he gets flames. He gets burning, but no no explosions. Yeah, no. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, I put out to uh, social media that we'd be watching this, see if anyone else had any thoughts. I only got a couple responses. Uh, Rob Barnett from over there at the Nashy cast and uh, the Buddy Pit said, never been able to get through it. <laughs> Emmerich's films are so cloying and stupid, I can rarely even bother anymore. I'm kind of on board with him right now, at least with this film for sure. Yeah, uh, and it, it it is dumbfounding that people thought this was one of his better attempts. <laughs> oh, I don't know if anyone thought it was one of his better. I think most people think it's one of his worst. Possibly. Despite the big box office. And then the only other response was over on that uh, counter social uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, Crystal Pegasus is the user's name. They say, actually, I quite enjoyed it. Reminded me of Clan of the Cave Bear a bit. <laughs> Honestly, I'd rather go watch Clan of the Cave Bear. I believe, isn't that the one that has like no dialogue? Something like that. Uh, this gets uh, paired off against Apocalypto, too, but uh, um, this is like the Disney-ized version of Apocalypto, and I'm not uh, saying that much. in a positive way. <laughs> no. But that's all we got from social media. Um, I, I know this is going to be a, a shocker if the critics didn't tend to like this film. <laughs> No, I'm afraid. Actually, this time, Tom, I am not surprised. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get. Um, I get. I got most of my stuff from Metacritic. So uh, those that think I'm just reading off things quickly, I am. So uh, go with it. Um, but from Chicago Tribune, Michael Phillips, uh, he writes: Emmerich has no time for poetry or magic. Even when the director has his digital wizards here doing wildly variable work, are trying to dazzle. He's a taskmaster and a field marshal, not a visionary. But I enjoyed 10,000 BC more and more and more than just about anything Emmerich's done before. Wow. Okay. That was one of the better ones. Um, then from Los Angeles time, Kenneth Duran, 10,000 BC is as crazy as it wants to be, plundering the past and other movies with that per peculiar Hollywood combination of the earnest and the preposterous that can result in the guiltiest of guilty pleasures. 
again, way more positive. Yeah, that actually sounds like he enjoyed it. Yeah, a little bit. That was on the uh, lighter side of things. Um, I, I had one here from um, from literally my town here. Oh, where, where did it go? No, there it is. Okay. Okay, from the Baltimore Sun, Michael Shragow. Um, I know I'm butchering that name. It's as if all the digital tools of new millennial filmmaking fell into the hands of men who had less storytelling sense than a campfire bard or a cave painter. <laughs> it's just... It's- so his his thinking is uh, if you put a if you put a room full of monkeys <laughs> yeah. with a uh, with a special you know, a CGI machine uh, you can get something like ten thousand BC. Yeah, basically. Um, and, and then this one's good. The Boston Globe tie burr. So yeah, it is a stinker, <laughs> but it is a prophesized that. But it is prophesized. That in six months' time, you shall come across 10,000 B.C. in the land of pay-per-view, and you shall say, pass the popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to read this one, because uh, so Metacritic, anyone that's visited the site, uh, when they do the, when they list the uh, various quotes from various uh, um, critics, they give it a numeric value, Um g- Stretching from green to yellow to red, it can go to 100 and down to zero. And those first two that I read were in the green. Those were 75 and 70. Uh, The uh, Baltimore Sun was 33. Boston Globe was 25. So now for the zero. (laughs) Okay. Someone actually got in there a full zero. Um, The Austin Chronicle, Mark Savlov. The only evolution in question here is that of Emmerich's skills as a director of a motion picture. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, he didn't like it. (laughs) No, it doesn't sound like it. No. We didn't like it either. (laughs) Nope. Is that it then? That that that's as, uh, as much as I will bear to tell everybody. <laughs> Fair enough. No, no. Uh, Ten thousand BC. Not a fan here. Not a fan from Tom either. <laughs> not recommended by the Time Shifters podcast. Wait, 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 wait. I'm gonna go out on one more here because I I just uh, I missed that I I had this in my notes. Rolling Stone. Peter Travers and, and uh, feel feel free to include beeps here. <laughs> Call it apocalypto for pussies. <laughs> <laughs> A PG thirteen rating, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was saying. This doesn't need a PG-13. Yeah, and then it continues. Or prehistory for pea brains. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't call it a a, a friendo. <laughs> I don't know where, why. At 10,000 BC will take your money, rob your time, and hit your brain like a shot of Novocaine. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and that one wasn't the zero. <laughs> No, this one, I, I definitely, I felt like a Neanderthal by the time I was done. I felt like my intelligence had dropped to that level. A <laughs> little, little, little bit, yeah. It, it was certainly, I felt like uh, Emmerich wanted my intelligence to be at that level. He needed it to be at that level. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I was thinking, you know, even a child, I think, would be bored. I mean, you had a, your, your kid watched, but your kid, you know, he's in, what, he's a teenager yeah, now. Yeah, he's 14, and, and his Tastes have been a little more sophisticated for his age, a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think even young kids would be bored to tears with this thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you'd hear like, make with the gore. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that is going to do it. I really want to put this one to bed, I honestly. Know. It's fun to uh, trash, though. Uh, I, it, we, we so rarely fully trash something, and this one just kind of deserves it. It, it kind of does. And we'll see what happens to our next <laughs> full episode. Oh, God. It's only fair because we made Tom watch Transformers. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, was, I honestly have spent almost a year trying to figure out a way to cut to this avoid one from this. the uh, docket. <laughs> yeah. 
But we are going to go ahead and watch 2009's Star Trek. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> it's That's going to be one hell of a conversation, I think, in a couple weeks. So come back and let us know what you thought of uh, 10,000 BC. Let us know what you think of 2009 Star Trek. That's going to do it for this episode. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Please follow the link in the show notes to all the social media and contact information. We really want to hear from you. Thanks a lot, Tom. We'll, uh, we'll try again, <laughs> maybe not next time, but maybe the time after that. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. See ya.